Well, it's great to see you this evening as we continue our study of James's letter uh, to the churches that had dispersed out from Jerusalem all uh, throughout uh, the northern part of Judea uh, and on into Asia Minor. And so uh, we're learning how James, who is Jesus' half-brother, was combining the wisdom of Proverbs and the Old Testament and the wisdom of Jesus that he had learned through Jesus' teaching, especially through Jesus' teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, and how that leads to real wisdom. And so we're learning week by week that the point of James's letter is, is the call to live according to the wisdom of Jesus. And the wisdom of Jesus is really summed up as being equal with Jesus' life. We live the way of Jesus. We, we speak the way He spoke. We uh, decide the way He made decisions. We uh, respond to the circumstances of life the way Jesus responded to these things. Jesus is the definition of wisdom. Uh, he is the Logos that uh, John talks about in his Gospel. And so what we have in Jesus' life and teaching uh, is a fulfillment of the wisdom tradition in the Old Testament and uh, the demonstration of, of the completion and fullness of that wisdom in the New Testament and in Jesus' life. And so what James does for us then is he takes that very lofty idea, uh, almost philosophical uh, as we think about wisdom, and he brings it to practical application. Another great definition for wisdom is knowledge applied. How do we really take what we know uh, and apply it to our daily situations. And so what we have in James are short, um, very instructive and illustrative lessons, uh, one after another, that are very compact so that uh, the believer would have really what, what I would call a tool bag of just great practical wisdom as we confront the different circumstances of life so that we respond in wisdom from above rather than the foolishness of this world. And when we live wisely after Jesus, we live redemptively. That's the other great sign of wise living is that when we follow after Jesus, when we think his thoughts, when we have the mind of Christ, then what happens is the world around us is redeemed. Things move heavenward. We are changed on the inside and, and we're grown and strengthened and, and we're redeemed. And every area of our life is redeemed, and then our relationships are redeemed, our, our work life is redeemed. And so a mark of the wise person uh, is the person who lives in such a way that the world around them is lifted towards Christ. And so we've just been walking through verse by verse since, since uh, James really breaks things down in small bite-sized chunks. Uh, we're, we're walking through this letter in the same way, just in, in, in small pieces. And so we're going to look at, at uh, James chapter 1, uh, uh, verses 9, 10, and 11. So just, just uh, uh, three more verses as we walk through this letter together. Just to give you a quick review of what we've been doing so far, uh, the, the idea that James introduces in the first verses of his letter is the idea of perfection. That's the point. And Jesus equals perfection. The idea is not someone who's simply uh, morally superior. They always do um, uh, what the rules say. Uh, but, uh, but perfection in the scripture is the person who is complete, a person who is mature, who's uh, integrated all the various aspects of their life, uh, are fully integrated around the reality of Jesus. And so that's the point. How can we be made perfect uh, even as the Heavenly Father is perfect? So that, that circles back to Jesus' injunction in the Sermon on the Mount. Be ye perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Lacking nothing, James says. And so that's the goal. And then James goes on to, to argue that the, the goal of perfection is pursued through trials and difficulties. And so we should rejoice even when trials come because they play a critical, non-negotiable role in the life of a Christian that's in pursuit of conformity with Christ. We want to go around trials. We want to avoid difficulties. But what James teaches is that the, that the wise and redemptive person is going to experience trials and tests of various kinds uh, in his life or in her life and that's a part of the process of, of, of uh, teaching them 
uh, what it means to be, uh, be wise people. And so we, we learned last week that another tool we're going to need in this pursuit of perfection, this pursuit of perfection through trials, is we're going to need wisdom. It's very difficult to live in wisdom and, and pursue wisdom when we're going through something that's very difficult and hard. We, uh, we tend to respond out of our flesh. We tend to respond with anxiety, worry, fear, pursuit of pleasure, abdication of responsibility. But uh, James says that we should pray for that wisdom that comes from above. It doesn't come from ourselves, but it's a gift that God will give. And once again, that wisdom is the way of Jesus. And so what we're going to look at in verses 9 through 11 then is another practical application. If we want to move towards perfection, and if we know trials are going to be a part of that, and if we know that we're going to need wisdom in order to properly respond to those trials, which are going to bring us into perfection, then a practical area is the issue of poverty. The issue of poverty and wealth. And so here's what James says, beginning in verse 9 of chapter 1. But the brother in humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and the flower falls off and the beauty of its appearance, if its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. And so the first thing James wants us to see is the test of poverty, what the poor man should do. And Jesus does a great deal of teaching on poverty and wealth, uh, on riches, on money. In fact, Jesus teaches on possessions and money really um, more than he teaches on anything else except for the kingdom of God itself. And so our relationship to our worldly possessions, our relationship to money and wealth is a great barometer of, of our uh, fundamental spiritual disposition. And so James leads out here real early, and, and there are several more times in this letter when the issue of poverty and wealth is going to come up because it's creating some tension in the church. And so the first thing that James speaks of in verse 9 is the test of poverty. Now I want to take a couple of minutes and, uh, and spend some time on, on getting a good definition of poverty. Um, and what I want to introduce you to is to the idea of absolute poverty and relative poverty. And I think what James is talking about here, in fact, what James is most definitely talking about here is absolute poverty. And a good definition of absolute poverty is the state of being unable to arrange for your basic needs. That's food, clothing, shelter, and, and health care. Uh, that uh, the person who's poor, the brother in humble circumstances, and that's just a, 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 another way to, uh, to define the, the Greek word for, for poor, uh, the person who is unable to arrange for, for, for his basic needs, who's at the mercy of his circumstances. Um, that's absolute poverty. Relative poverty is... Um, one's level of possessions in comparison to the level of possessions of others. What relative poverty basically means is, is I don't have as much as someone else. Are there other people in my field of vision who have a great deal more than me? We're going to get to that in just a second, but, but I believe that what James is talking about is absolute poverty, unable to arrange for the basic needs of life. What that means is, uh, for the person in the first century, they were living from day to day. They were living right at the margins between life and death. At any moment, really from day to day, um, starvation or exposure or the, the crushing weight of the injustice of the, the Roman Empire, that they lived with the, with the closeness of the threat of losing their lives from day to day to day because they were at the mercy of their circumstances. And in James's day, that accounted for the vast majority of, of, of the people. Most people were just really day laborers uh, or slaves, uh, and they lived uh, at the mercy of their circumstances, not really knowing from day to day whether they would get to the next day or to the next season, uh, whether or not uh, some uh, power might come riding in and rob them of what little they had or even robbed them of their lives. And that was, the, that was the experience of most of the people that James was talking to, and that was the experience of, of most of the people 
uh, uh, in uh, the first century Roman world. But I want to make to you a, a, a quick case for those of you who, who might be tempted to put yourself in the category of, of, of poor. Uh, I, I want to make the case that essentially no one in the U.S. is poor in an absolute sense. No, no one in the U.S. So I'm, I'm teaching this message today to people who uh, verse 9 in many ways does not apply to you in terms of material circumstances. A um, couple, couple of stats to support that. Uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University uh, says that less than 1% of children in America suffer from malnutrition. Less than 1% of children in America suffer from malnutrition. And their definition of malnutrition uh, means either not enough uh, uh, calories taken in per day or too much, uh, too, uh, too, too many calories are taken in per day. The truth is among uh, the poor in America, they're more likely to be suffering from obesity uh, than they are from malnourishment. Uh, uh, obesity as a result of eating poor quality food or making um, unhealthy choices about food. But very, very, very few people uh, suffer from malnutrition uh, in the U.S. 0.2% uh, of the population in the U.S. is homeless. Um, there's a, always a great deal of talk. You'll, you'll hear about the homelessness crisis and it's sad that anyone is homeless. I, we ought to be sensitive and, and caring and concerned about anyone, any child that doesn't have enough to eat. That's not the point that I'm making. Uh, the point that I'm, I'm making is that, uh, that widespread poverty is not really uh, the experience uh, of people in America. Another stat, uh, the poverty line in America is a household income of less than $25,000 a year. But the world poverty level uh, for, a, for a family is less than $3,500 a year. So the poor in America, uh, their income is about seven times higher than the poor in the rest of the world. Uh, the American poor have cars, they have air conditioning in their homes, they have technology in their homes, TVs, uh, cell phones, and access to those kinds of things. They have access to school, uh, they have access to health care. Uh, the Brookings Institute says that if a, if a poor person will not have illegitimate children, uh, will finish high school, and they'll get, get a job, they go directly to the middle class. There's, there's essentially a, 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 a pathway uh, and a railway really right to the middle class. Um, and just to give some context, absolute poverty uh, in the world, that means a dollar ninety a day. People who make a dollar ninety a day are, and less are considered to be in the category of being abs uh, of absolute poverty. They, they are, they are uh, unable to arrange for these basic needs of life. The number of people in the world uh, who fit into the category of absolute poverty, that number was halved uh, between 2000 and 2012. It's the greatest reduction in poverty in human history by, by, by factors, multiple uh, factors. Um, uh, the, the truth is by 2030, uh, the expectation from the UN is that no one, essentially no one, will, will live below the dollar ninety a day threshold. Uh, the truth is, in, a, in the world, there are as many obese people in the world as there are malnourished people in the world, uh, and that ought to be the cause for uh, for celebration. And the truth is, for uh, for the small percentage of people in America that that fall into a category of real material difficulty, and there are people like that. Um, and we'll take homelessness for instance. There, there are about 500,000 people in America who are homeless, but the great majority uh, of the explanation for that homelessness is not crushing uh, injustice in our system. Uh, but the vast majority of people who are homeless struggle with mental illness, uh, they struggle with drug, drug abuse, they struggle with other character, characterological issues, they, they, uh, they, they're not virtuous people, uh, or they were reared in an environment where they simply uh, uh, did not acquire the fundamental life skills uh, to, to get along, or there are very serious cognitive difficulties. There's a, there's a, uh, uh, there are intellectual uh, inabilities that, that um, uh, 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 make life a, a great struggle uh, and a great difficulty. But the challenge in America is not absolute poverty. The challenge in America is relative poverty. 
Uh, it's the experience that someone else has more than I have, and, and everyone can identify with that. There's a, uh, there's a certain um, emotional experience to being around people who, who have more than, than you do. Um, and uh, the challenge right now in our culture is two visions. Um, uh, until recently, the, what, what we believed in America is if someone had more than you, then you just needed to do an evaluation of what your values were. It may be that you're not willing to do uh, and, and really ought not do what it takes to have a certain uh, way of living. Or uh, you realize you could do better. Uh, you could be working harder. You could take on more responsibility. You could be a better steward of your gifts. And so get to it. Uh, step forward, uh, take responsibility, have, have a, a bigger vision for your life. But the, the problem over these last several years that I've addressed in some sermons recently is that the, the, uh, the, the, the problem of income inequality is only and solely a function of the injustice of our system and the only solution th therefore to the problem of income inequality is to, de to destroy the current system uh, of, of capitalism, free markets, uh, and democracy and, and have some other system uh, come in that imposes a utopia uh, of, of, of income equality. Uh, a little sidelight is I don't believe uh, uh, anyone um, is going to be uh, blessed and helped by whatever it takes to impose income, absolute income equality on everyone else. I think, it, I think we'll all equally have nothing uh, if that happens, but, but I digress. Um, and so what I want to say for those of you who are hearing me today and you hear verse 9, uh, uh, the rich man is to glory in his humiliation. I'm not, that's not verse, that verse is not really for you. In fact, the good application for us uh, is uh, t to uh, reflect on Jesus' application in the Sermon on the Mount in the Beatitudes where he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. The truth is we ought to adopt uh, and are encouraged to adopt. This would have been very unpopular in the Greco-Roman world uh, to adopt an attitude of humility and an attitude that says, I am not in charge of my fate. Uh, I, I live at the mercy of another. I'm a servant. I, I don't do what I want to do. I don't wake up in the morning and, and do the things that interest me, but I do what someone else wants. I live and my circumstances are at the mercy of someone other than me. And that is true, and that is the proper attitude, and that's what it means to be poor in spirit. And so the rich, uh, the uh, the brother in humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. It's a recognition uh, that even though in and of myself I do not have what it takes to, uh, to, uh, uh, to rule uh, my life uh, and to ac acquire the things that I need, even though I'm very poor uh, and even though I'm very needy and even though I, I need a great deal of help, I'm a child of the King. I can rejoice and celebrate my high position, not because of who I am, but because of who God is and what He has said about me and, uh, and what He's done for me in Christ Jesus. And I can, I can rejoice every single day in how good God is and how good it is to live uh, in surrender to Him and uh, in um, trust in Him and an expectation that He uh, is uh, the Lord of all things, and He's the Lord over my life. Uh, we should rejoice that this is the case. Um, it's an acknowledgement that when things uh, 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 that things go wrong, when I try to be the Lord of my own life, when I when I try to impose my will on the world and on others around me, it always turns out badly. And so, it's a picture of what Paul says in Second Corinthians chapter twelve when he when he was speaking of a time when things were going well. He had had this great vision, and then there was a thorn in his flesh uh, that taught him that he was not in control. That taught him that he was a uh, he, he lived by grace. Uh, and so Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, I'm going to boast in my weaknesses. I'm going to boast in the things about me uh, that aren't strong so that I can give glory to the one who really is in charge. We can glory in the fact that the one who does run the universe is both good and great. And uh, our hope and our life is in him. And so the test of poverty is the constant test of always acknowledging when uh, when we experience loss, when we're reminded that we are not in charge, 
uh, when our circumstances do change, that uh, the test is to fix our eyes uh, on the Lord, on Jesus, and rejoice in His goodness to us and expect for Him to take care of us and provide uh, and lead us even when the circumstances in life are difficult. That's the test of poverty. In the verses 10 and 11, we have the danger of wealth. This is really the, 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 the part of this instruction that applies specifically to us because all of us live in a, live in a, a set of circumstances in which we are able to arrange for our basic needs. Food, clothing, shelter, the basic needs of life. Uh, are provided for us. Uh, we have these things. We don't live every day worried about whether or not uh, we're going to have enough food to survive to the next day. Uh, but, but we really are uh, people who are rich. And so, um, uh, those of, and because of that, uh, we need to, to be very careful and rejoice in the fact that uh, our riches and our material wealth are not... Um, that's not uh, what we're depending on. And so the danger of, of, of wealth and riches can be defined like this. And once again, this can be um, abstracted out of Jesus' teaching. And it's what really I believe James has in mind as he teaches about this. The rich person and the danger of these riches, number one, believes that he's in control. The rich person believes fundamentally that he's in control too, that, that his... Riches, the fact that his basic needs are taken care of, are attributable mainly to his efforts. I'm so smart, and I work so hard, and I'm so wonderful. Uh, I've been able to, to take care of myself. Number three, as a result of numbers one and two, it's the belief that, that because of what I have, I'm better than people who don't. I'm better than other people. Fourthly, that joy and meaning and life come from the comforts and pleasures of this world. The, the, that's what should be pursued because the, the good things in life uh, really are, are hardwired to, the, to, the, to, the, to my happiness and my pleasure uh, in this world. Fundamentally, this definition of, of, of riches is grace-free. It's grace-free. It's fundamentally rooted in this idea uh, that, that what I have, I have because I earned it. I deserve it. And this is a profound spiritual danger. Hear this, and this is a warning. Be warned. That is a profound spiritual danger, and, and a judgment will come, and all of, uh, of that attitude and the life lived that way will be judged, uh, and it will be destroyed. And so uh, Jesus teaches on this in, in his parables, uh, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, you know that, and, and their fates, uh, the parable of the rich fool, the, the, the man who builds bigger and bigger barns and, uh, and doesn't realize that uh, his life is going to be required of him. It's taught in Jesus' relationships with the rich young ruler, with Zacchaeus, that their wealth, uh, their great wealth uh, had... Um, had fractured their relationship with God. Uh, in Jesus' teachings, Jesus teaches that where your treasure is, that's where your heart is, that, um, that you cannot serve God and money. Be warned, Jesus says. Be warned, James says. Don't have these attitudes that are grace-free. Because verse 11 teaches that our circumstances can change instantly. Uh, the, 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 the sun shines and the desert wind blows and, and, and an area that looks beautiful and green and verdant and flowers everywhere in one day could be gone, will be gone. Uh, and so uh, we've learned during this COVID season, the circumstances can change instantly. And we need to take that lesson to heart. And uh, as I've said, there's also an eschatological tone to this. There's an, there's a, an idea that judgment day is coming and our, we're going to be tested. Paul will say your, 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 your life and the way you lived it is going to be tested. If you built your life from wood, hay, and stubble or you built your life uh, on gold, silver, and precious stones, that's going to be evaluated by the fire of judgment. And when wood, hay, and stubble uh, is a life lived uh, and uh, hopes resting in the things of this world, none of that goes into the new creation. And if our hope is in the pleasures of this world and the acquisitions of this world, it is woefully misplaced uh, and it will, and it leaves 
the rich person outside of salvation. It leaves the rich person outside of faith because they have not trusted in the Lord. They have trusted in themselves. That's the danger of wealth. And so what should we do? Uh, we need to have a daily attitude of gratitude. We need to have a poverty of spirit, a constant remembrance uh, of the fact that our lives really are in the Lord's hands. And so how do we do this? Uh, some good attitudes of gratitude as I get ready to close. First of all, a realization that everything you have is a gift. You wake up in the morning and the first thing you declare is, I am the poster child for grace. Everything I have is a gift. Look at verse 17. James writes, For every good thing and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. It does not come from you. And so just do a little spiritual inventory, a gratitude inventory. Sing that hymn, count your many blessings, name them one by one. My life, the fact that I woke up alive this morning, my health, my family, my possessions, my achievements, all these good things are gifts from the Lord. They're, they're from the Lord. Thirdly, since all these things are gifts, they're not mine. They're not, they don't belong to me to do with what I want. I'm a steward of these things. I'm a steward of these things. Lord, you've given me these things uh, to have for, for as long as you want me to have them. How am I to use them for you? Jesus tells the parable of the servants being given talents. Uh, and our job is to invest them back in the kingdom. Since, I, uh, since it's not mine, everything I have is to be stewarded. Fourth, since what I have isn't mine, he can take them away as he sees fit for his glory and for my good. And so when something that, that I have, maybe that I've begun to love too much, uh, the Lord will take it away. Um, uh, it, there may be something the Lord wants to teach me that he can't teach me as long as I have something, so he takes it away. Uh, that's upsetting to us. We don't like having things taken away, but the wise person, the mature person, says, Lord, in worship, um, they let every disappointment be a call to worship. Lord, what are you trying to teach me? Uh, uh, experiencing God. Uh, a, a great study of knowing and doing the will of God says, pray this prayer. Lord, teach me the truth of my circumstances. Reveal to me the truth of my circumstances. How is this going to glorify you? And how is this going to be for my good and my spiritual maturity? Since we've already known that trials and tests produce endurance and perseverance and patience uh, so that we can be perfect. Uh, uh, and so, if all these things are true, then our attitude about wealth can be found, and we'll get back to this again in chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. Come now, James says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. This is the attitude of the rich, and frankly, this is the attitude of all of us. Every single one of you that's listening to this today, this is how you fundamentally Think about life, your default position when you're not thinking about the Lord is I'm going to get up, I have the things I need to do what I want today, and so I'm going to get up and I'm going to do what I want to do uh, to act in my self-interest. Verse 14, Yet you don't know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're a vapor that appears for a little while then vanishes away. You're a flower of the field who's here one minute and gone the next. And so, verse 15 says, Instead you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we live we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. So instead of, of waking up and saying, well, what do I want to do today? You wake up in the morning and you say, Lord, you've been so good to me. You've given me another day. What do you want to do? Where do you want me to go? What kingdom uh, a cause do you want me to advance? That's the that's the one who is poor in spirit, who recognizes my life is in someone else's hands and my life is in the hand of the one who is good and great and gracious. And when we live that way, we, we are properly positioned for the test of poverty and the danger of wealth. I'm going to try to redouble my efforts at living this way and I hope you will too as we pursue wisdom and as we per pursue perfection, as we study together the wisdom of Jesus that we find in James. You have a blessed evening.